Hi, I'm Katie Wick from the City of Sioux Falls Health Department here today with Dr. Charles Schaefer, one of our faculty physicians. We're talking today about a public health issue, a disease that we've seen a bit of a resurgence of in the last couple of years. We haven't talked about maybe for a long time and, and now we're hearing more about it in that syphilis. So thanks for joining us today, Dr. Schaefer. Um, let's, we've, we've heard, why are we hearing so much more about syphilis right now? Well, syphilis has been around for a long time, like probably 500 years. The first documented pretty, pretty certain outbreak of syphilis was in the 1400s, actually. And it was a huge deal until the mid-1940s, early 1940s, when penicillin was discovered. And it was found that penicillin worked great to treat it. And ever since then, ever since World War II era, the syphilis numbers have come down and just kind of been at a low level, uh, with a few exceptions until fairly recently, around, around the year 2000, that started changing and we started seeing more and more cases. And um, now we've seen kind of an explosion of cases in the last couple of years, especially. So that's the reason you're hearing more about it. Um, why that's happening uh, is, is not exactly clear. I think some of, some of it has to do with the pandemic, um, just in that people's behaviors changed a little bit. Uh, there was less routine health care going on, uh, for example. Um, but um, so it's not exactly completely understood why it's exploded the way it has. So when we say exploded, we don't just mean a small number of new cases. The explosion is, is you know, how many fold is it that right. we're seeing in well, South Dakota? <laughs> yeah. In South Dakota, you know, I've, uh, I've done talks about this for a while with our, with our residency at the Family Medicine Residency. and. We've always lagged behind the rest of the country as far as syphilis goes. I mean, we've been kind of down here and the rest of the country's kind of up here. The last 10 years or so, we've caught up gradually. We've increased our numbers significantly, but we didn't ever catch up to the, to the rest of the country. Now we have far exceeded the rest of the country as far as um, per capita rates of syphilis, which is pretty scary. Okay, so um, it's been around for a long time, but what exactly is syphilis? Well, it's an infection that tends to be sexually transmitted, not exclusively, but, but almost exclusively. Um, and it's caused by a, a bacterium called Treponema pallidum, which is very interesting. It's a, it's a little corkscrew shaped thing that, that uh, it's kind of fun to watch under a microscope, um, but uh, it's very destructive. It's, it's an interesting disease in that um, a lot of people don't, they have it, but they don't know that they have it because it doesn't always cause symptoms. It's very much like HIV in that regard, is that you might have symptoms early on, but you might not. And so you can live for years without even knowing that you have it. Okay, so talk about some of the symptoms. If someone would have symptoms, what would those symptoms be? Well, there's multiple stages. There's three stages that we think of when we talk about syphilis. The first is, is called primary syphilis. And that is where someone gets a little a bump uh, or a sore that then turns into an ulcer. Uh, can be pretty impressive ulcer, uh, like a, a big hole in your skin that doesn't hurt. That's the weird thing about it is it's painless. And these ulcers show up at the site that the bacterium entered the body. So usually that's going to be in the genital area, but it could be anywhere. It could be anywhere in your body. Um, so what happens with that, that usually shows up in about 10 to 90 days after infection. Um, the average is about three weeks. And so the, the, uh, the little bit scary thing about it is that it resolves on its own. And so, you know, if you have someone who's, who's kind of upper Midwest stoic uh, kind of personality and they say, oh my gosh, I have this weird thing, but it doesn't hurt, so it must not be a big deal. And then it goes away on its own and then they think, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm glad that's gone. But it's not really gone. It's, it's throughout their entire body uh, causing damage and, uh, and being potentially spread to someone else at the same time. So that's what we call primary syphilis. Secondary syphilis is the next stage of that process. And these are not a totally separate. They can, they can have some overlap, um, but that's more of a, what we call a systemic illness where you might have fever, you might have swollen lymph nodes, you have oftentimes a rash, it can be head to toe rash, uh, with the, the, the unique thing about it being that it affects the palms and the soles, which is very unusual. There are not very many things that do that. Um, well, you may have heard of syphilis being called the great imitator uh, in the past because it can, it can look like just about any other disease process. 
So it's very confusing, and, and, and because the symptoms are kind of nonspecific sometimes, with the exceptions that I mentioned, um, it's not always recognized as syphilis. So, so that's secondary syphilis. Um, those, the primary and secondary syphilis are the contagious, are, are the most contagious uh, stages of syphilis. So at that point, by contagious, you mean they can pass it on to someone else, pass it where on to they're in that else. first or second, primary or secondary. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Then, um, and, and the, the primary and secondary cases account for about half of the cases that are diagnosed. Um, so the other half of the cases, the vast majority of those are just when someone has a blood test done because they want to be tested or, or who knows what. They have to be tested for work or for some other purpose, who knows. Um, and they have no symptoms. And we call that situation latent syphilis. It means it's the, the bacteria is in your body, it's circulating everywhere, um, but you don't have any symptoms. And so it's just kind of sitting there. Now there's two, there's two segments of latent syphilis. We call it early latent syphilis. If, you, if we can prove that you've been infected in the last 12 months. So let's say you had a test for syphilis nine months ago, it was negative, and now you have a positive test. Now, we, so we can say, well, we know you got it in the last nine months. So in that situation, two things, it's easily treatable at that point, but it also, um, it also is, uh, can be transmitted, it's contagious. So, so your contagious can give it to someone else in primary syphilis, secondary syphilis, or what we call early latent syphilis. Then we also have what we call late latent, which means that um, we have a positive blood test, but we can prove that it was more than a year ago that you got this or we suspect it, um, or we don't know when you got it, which is not unusual actually. And so then we call, we, we call that syphilis of undetermined uh, duration, unknown duration. That situation probably is not contagious and it's interesting that a lot of people, because you have a painless ulcer uh, to start with that goes away on its own, uh, not everyone gets that big rash that we talked about or other, or other identifiable symptoms. So it's interesting that you could get through the primary and secondary stages without ever recognizing that you've been infected. And, and so you could live that way decades. I mean, you could live the rest of your life infected with syphilis you may or may not develop what we call tertiary syphilis, or, or um, um, that, that's the next stage that uh, affects probably about 30% of people who get to that point. 70% will, will just live with syphilis in their body, never know it, and may, may die with it. But 30% um, 30 will develop other complications, including um, the, uh, the biggest three things, there are, there are, it's cardiovascular syphilis, we call it, which affects the, the huge artery coming off your heart, the aorta, uh, which can develop big aneurysms, which can rupture. If that happens, you're pretty much done, <laughs> dead, um, is, is one of the big things. Um, you can have gummas, which are um, kind of rubbery tumors that can form anywhere in your body. Uh, they're, it's kind of unusual, kind of a weird thing. You don't see a lot of this of tertiary syphilis. Um, so that's, that's not a big thing that we see. You can have neurologic problems, um, dementia, for example, um, stroke-like situations, uh, things like that. So um, those can arise decades later, uh, never be recognized. Now there's, there's also something called neurosyphilis that affects the the, the brain and the, the neurologic system. And that can happen at any time, during, whether it's primary, secondary, or latent, or tertiary syphilis. Um, because even though primary syphilis starts out as a, as a sore, a, a very defined sore, it's already a systemic process, meaning the bacteria has already spread throughout your whole body. Uh, wherever the blood goes, these, these bacteria can go. And if it establishes itself in the nervous system, um, that can become a, a huge problem. Uh, and it's very difficult to treat that. It, it's not impossible to treat it, but it's harder to treat than, than the other stages. Okay, so when we come back, we're gonna talk a little bit about, we've heard the stages of the syphilis, then we'll talk about who's at risk and how you treat that. I'm Dr. Kathleen Haight with Falls Community Health. Today we'll be talking about a summer health topic, sunscreen. 
Out here on the prairie, it pays to be quite wary. When the thermometer says hot, you need to think a lot about safety for your skin before you jump right in to the pool or your hike or that trip on your bike. Everybody knows when you burn, you can blister, so get some SPF for your grandma and your sister. 50 and above for the people that you love. It might seem extreme, but there's no fun without screen. Welcome back. Uh, we are here again with Dr. Charles Schaefer talking about a disease that's sh shown some resurgence here in the community and in, in the nation, uh, syphilis. So thanks for joining us uh, again, Dr. Schaefer. So we'll continue with this discussion. Uh, we kind of talked about the different stages of syphilis and, and how that some of that progression goes. Um, in order to get this early, um, talk a little bit about who would be at risk for getting syphilis. Yeah, that's an excellent question. It might be simpler to talk first about who's not at risk, and, and that would be, because this is a sexually transmitted illness, that would be anyone who's not having sex, <laughs> who has sex only with another person who's not infected with syphilis, so what we would call mutually monogamous with an uninfected partner. Um, uh, those would be the people who wouldn't, who wouldn't be getting it. So if the, the highest risk people are those who have multiple partners. Um, men who have sex with men tend to be at highest risk. Um, we, we see it, groups of people who, let's say, um, exchange sex for drugs or money, for example, that's a high risk setting. Um, certain racial groups are at higher risk statistically, and that would be African Americans and also Native Americans, particularly here in South Dakota. Now, now, that doesn't mean, I mean, none of these things is, like if you're a man who has sex with men and you're Native American, for example, you're not gonna definitely get syphilis mm -hmm. because this is very behavioral based. But statistically, we know that, that particularly in South Dakota, Natives are higher risk to have syphilis as well as blacks throughout the country. Um, it's, it's something that we see. So there are certain groups that are at higher risk, but uh, anyone who's sexually active not with a uh, single person who's uninfected is at risk potentially. And another interesting thing about syphilis, you know, as a doctor, I get questions from young people particularly a lot is, can I get an STD from kissing somebody? And usually the answer is no, but in this case, it's actually yes. You can get syphilis through intimate contact that's not sexual, I mean, just from kissing uh, or close contact because there are lesions in secondary syphilis that um, we call them mucus patches. I didn't mention that earlier, but it, can, it just looks kind of like a, a, a small or large uh, kind of sore, on a, maybe on the lip or, or in the mouth somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it's just teeming with these little uh, spirochetes, we call them. And so uh, it is possible to be infected without being sexually active. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, that's, it's gonna be very uh, limited as far as that goes. Um, and it's almost certainly, almost always rather, uh, a sexually transmitted thing. So, so the, th the behaviors that put you at risk for uh, sexually transmitted illnesses are exactly what puts you at risk for syphilis. One thing I didn't mention that I should is that uh, another significant risk factor is people who have sex while under the influence of alcohol or drugs just because the decision making is is not good then and that's a common risk factor as well okay so um we talked about the risk factor so talk to us about is there anybody else at risk like in pregnancy or anything like that um would an unborn child be at risk for something like this yeah great question that you know, pregnancy tends to be sexually transmitted as well. <laughs> uh, and so the same risk factors uh, are, that are there for, for STDs are there for pregnancy. So um, they often do travel together. And there's, there's a tremendously negative impact on pregnancies if syphilis is there. So because of that, uh, the routine currently at the moment is uh, for anyone who's pregnant to be tested when they begin their OB care uh, with their family doctor, their obstetrician. Uh, so at the first visit, at 28 weeks gestation, so about two thirds of the way through, and again at delivery, at the time of delivery, we test for syphilis at all three of those, of those junctures. Additionally, we would test if there's, in, in, the, in between times, if there's any reason that, that we should test. For example, they've had a sexual encounter with someone who may have had syphilis or, or whatever high risk situation there may be. 
So, so definitely we test because of the huge impact. In the, in the old days, um, uh, I'm showing my age a little bit here, uh, most states had laws that you had to be tested for syphilis before you got married. They don't do that anymore, but because of the tremendous impact of syphilis on a pregnancy, that was, that was the reason for that. So, so what happens if we don't detect syphilis in a pregnant woman? Um, then the risk of developing something called congenital syphilis becomes very real. And, and we hadn't had cases of congenital syphilis in South Dakota for a long, long, many years. Um, in 2021, we had 16 cases documented and four stillbirths, which means that the baby is born dead. Um, in addition to that risk, the risk of stillbirth, you have, uh, let's say that if the, if the child is born uh, and does fine as far as that goes, uh, but is infected, you can have some irreversible uh, neurologic problems. You can have changes in facial structure, bony structure. I had one patient, this is old school kind of stuff. I had one patient who was infected, who's born in the 30s and was a congenital syphilis uh, victim. And he had enough neurologic issues and cognitive issues that he could not live independently. He, had to, he was institutionalized his entire life. Um, so that's the kind of impact we're talking about. And it, can be a, it can be a tremendously negative thing, <laughs> even to the point of where the, where the, where the baby dies or the infant uh, shortly after birth can die as well. Okay, so you're talking about testing. So uh, tell us, what is the test for syphilis? How do we do uh, testing? Is it difficult? Is it easy? Um, it's kind of both. It's easy to do the testing. The test results don't always completely make sense. It's, it can be a very kind of sticky, complicated thing to interpret. Uh, and when that happens, because of the tremendously negative impact of, of untreated syphilis on someone, we say, well, not exactly sure what's going on here, but let's treat them to be certain that we don't miss something. So. Syphilis can be, in a situation like this in South Dakota where we have a lot of syphilis right now, um, you, can, you can have someone who comes in with a classic presentation, that painless ulcer we talked about, painless genital ulcer typically, or they have a classic rash on their palms that includes their palms and soles. You can say with pretty good certainty that that is a syphilis mm -hmm. case. Now we still do the test, uh, which includes, it's a blood test basically. And um, there are two different kinds of tests, uh, and you need to do both kinds of tests because uh, the, the only real definitive test was, there are, there are actually two of those, this gets kind of complicated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there, the old school definitive test was what we call dark field microscopy, where, where you took the lesion, the patient with the lesion, and you just scrape that with like, like a, say a gauze, you take that sample and you put it under a, a special microscope and you can actually see the little treponemes, the, the little corkscrew organisms um, under the microscope. It's a tricky technique to do. Not many people do that anymore. There's a, there's a pretty new uh, high-tech, really, I mean, this is kind of how we test for a lot of things now, a nucleic acid test, but there's not one that's commercially available. And so, so that really old and the really new things are not really available anymore. So we have what, what is available in the middle, mm -hmm. which is uh, there's a section of tests or a, a type of test called treponemal tests, which it's an antibody test. So a test for the antibody that your body makes to fight the infection that it, that mm -hmm. it detects. Um, and those antibodies are against specifically that, those syphilis germs, basically, mm -hmm. to put it in simple terms. Then we have a, a group of tests called non-treponemal tests, and those are non-specific tests, meaning that they can be positive for other reasons, like when mm -hmm. someone's pregnant or they have certain other diseases, those tests can be falsely positive. But the nice thing about that is you, there's a number that goes with that test. Um, there's a, a kind of a technique of, of doing different dilutions to see how, how much antibody, excuse me, is in the person's body. Uh, and it helps us understand uh, where they are in the process mm -hmm. in terms of have they been treated, have they not been treated, have they been reinfected, for example. Okay. So we, we take all that information, we take the clinical picture, you know, what, what symptoms a patient has, if any, what findings they have on examination, and then uh, the treponemal test result, the non-treponemal test result, uh, the titer that goes with that. We look at all those things, and usually, usually you can you can come up with an explanation of where this person is in the process. Okay.
So a little bit complicated. So is, how complicated is the treatment then? Is this curable? Is this something that's easily treated? Yeah, it's very easily treated actually, um, which is great because <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it would be really bad if we had yeah. that nasty disease that had no treatment. Uh, but in this case, the treatment is very simple. It's a shot of penicillin mm -hmm. for those early cases that we talked about. Primary syphilis, that's the painless ulcer. Secondary syphilis, which is the, could be the rash, could be all these other symptoms. Um, or that what we call early latent, so someone who's been infected within the last 12 months, if we can know that, we give them one shot of penicillin and they're done. Okay. They're, and, and there has not really been uh, documented resistance to penicillin. Now, um, it gets a little stickier. Uh, let's say it's someone who we, who we don't know when they were infected, could have been years ago, or they have what we call late to latent. Then we give them three shots of penicillin a week apart. And so uh, that, and that is also very effective. A couple problems. One is that some people are truly allergic to penicillin. A lot of people that think they're allergic to penicillin aren't actually allergic. They had allergic, they had some other kind of reaction, maybe when they were a child. But if someone is truly allergic, like a life-threatening reaction, then we kind of don't want to give them penicillin. There are alternatives that can be used that are not as effective uh, in treating syphilis. Sometimes, uh, let's say a pregnant woman comes in and is, and is penicillin allergic, we will actually do what we call desensitization, where probably they'd go see an allergist and give them tiny amounts of penicillin just gradually building up to where they don't react to it, uh, because that's the only effective treatment for, for pregnant women. Um, the treatment for neurosyphilis, which is, is the uh, infect, that infection around the brain, is even more complicated. You can't just give a shot. Well, you can, but you have to do it every day for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. That's not very fun. So typically how that is done is people are admitted to the hospital. They get IV penicillin every four hours for 10 to 14 days, which is uh, kind of a big deal. Um, and so, so the, the various stages are, again, imminently treatable, but not always in an easy fashion. Now, the, the important thing about that is that that easy treatment can only be given when we know someone's infected. And that's why it's so important to test, number one. It's so important to come in when you have something weird going on that could be syphilis or when you've potentially been exposed. Um, or if, you, if you've been in those, one of those uh, risk groups that we talked about, not even recently, um, you probably should be tested if you haven't. Just okay. because, for example, uh, another a, a corollary might be hepatitis C. We saw a lot of people have been diagnosed with hepatitis C recently. Many of them, it, it, it was an infection that happened in the, in the 60s or 70s when they were uh, flower children or hippies or whatever you might say, however you want to describe the, the, the social set setting then and they were involved in IV drug use way back, I mean, 50 years ago. And yet they were infected and they, they're still infected because uh, most people don't clear hepatitis C on their own. Same thing can happen is that if, you were, if you're not maybe a member of one of those high risk groups right now regarding syphilis, but you were 20 years ago, you were involved with multi, multiple sexual partners, for example, and you've never been tested for syphilis, you should be tested because it's possible that you were infected then and you still are and you don't realize it. Okay, so kind of the last thing, what's the best way for prevention of syphilis? Give us some tips on prevention. Prevention uh, of syphilis is the same as prevention for other sexually transmitted illnesses. Um, absolute prevention is to not be sexually active or to be sexually active only with someone, with one partner who you know is uninfected. Um, I have patients who, who think that they are in a mutually monogamous relationship, but they don't know that their partner is actually going out on them. And so that's not always a, a known thing, a thing that you can know for certain, unfortunately. Um, short of that, using condoms can be helpful, but because of the nature of syphilis, where, where that ulcer that starts things off, shows up at the point that the bacteria entered the body, it doesn't necessarily, uh, show up in a place that would be covered by a condom. Mm -hmm. And so they're not 100% by any means. Backing up a little bit, um, 
the, because many people are infected while under the influence of alcohol or drugs, um, either, either avoiding situations where you may be sexually active uh, in an intoxicated state or, or doing something about if you have an alcohol or drug problem so that, so that you don't put yourself at risk uh, would be a place to uh, kind of backing the truck up a little bit, uh, looking not specifically at that encounter but at a bigger picture kind of prevention. Uh, those things can be really helpful and important. All right, well, we appreciate this. this is a great information, a lot, of, a lot of facts that we need to get out there and let everybody know what's going on. So we appreciate all of your uh, information, Dr. Schaefer. So if you have any questions, please contact your personal physician or Falls Community Health at 605-367-8793, and they can help you with any testing or treatment or any other questions that you may have.